Christ Church. We're glad that you're here. If you're new with us, we would love to make a connection with you, and you can meet us out in the lobby at our Welcome Center. Right now, I want to invite you to stand. And as we begin our time together this morning, I'm going to be reading a part of Psalm 77. And what's interesting about this psalm is that the beginning part of the psalm, the psalmist is just crying out to God in desperation. But there's this turning point. And the turning point is this, when he says, I will remember. And he calls himself to remember who God is and all that he has done. And the specific point in history that the psalmist is remembering is the Exodus story. The story of God delivering his people out of slavery. And that's actually what we're gonna be focusing on together this morning. So allow me to read this for us. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands and I would not be comforted. Then I thought, to this I will appeal the years when the Most High stretched out His right hand. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, God. The waters saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The heavens resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the world. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. The same God who led his people out of slavery with a mighty hand, who performed incredible miracles in Egypt, displaying his glory for all to see. The same God that the psalmist is worshiping and praising is here with us this morning. And he is just as holy. He is just as worthy of our worship. He is just as faithful to keep his promises. So this morning, as we sing to him, let's remember who he is. Let's remember all that he has done and give him the glory that he is due.
respond this morning to our faithful God. We declare that we can put our trust in Him because He does not change. He keeps His promises. And we say yes to your promises. Our confidence is your faithful. Every breath we could ever breathe, live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up our eyes in wonder. Heart. 
Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. Good morning, Christ Church. How are we doing? Good. It's good to see the 915 service, my favorite service, you know. It's pretty awesome. I don't say that to every service. I'm telling you, it'd be weird if I walked into the 8 o'clock and said, good morning, 915, you're my favorite service. So I would not say that. It would just be weird. Well, hey, if you're uh, new to Christ Church, if this is your first time or your first time in a long time, we're glad that you are here. Grateful you have decided to join us uh, this morning. I uh, would love to meet you in the lobby after the service. We'd love to meet uh, any of you who are here at Christ Church this morning. So if you see me at a restaurant or at the grocery store or just walking down the side of the road, please help me and give me a ride if you see me in that situation. But uh, we'd love to meet you and get to know you and, uh, you know, uh, fellowship with one another. I have a question as we start off today talking about the power of our glorious God by a show of hands. Uh, who in the room is a baseball fan. Any baseball fans out there? Let me see them. Yeah, where are the Royal fans at? You guys are doing pretty well this year. Where are the Cardinals fans at? Yeah, yeah. Let's not woo too big because uh, we're not doing so hot right now, last in our division. But uh, I am a Cardinals fan and growing up my favorite baseball player was Mark McGuire. Uh, in 1998 he set the season, single season home run record with 70 home runs and uh, it was 1998 was the very year I started playing t-ball and so in an effort to play, pay homage to my home run hero, I wore the jersey number 25 for all of my baseball career. And uh, you know what else I did as a young kid? Uh, I drank a lot of milk. And uh, you'll see the ad pop up on the screen. This is the reason that I drank a lot of milk, because Mark McGuire drank a lot of milk. This is what the ad reads. Time for more milk. It's got stuff leading sports drinks don't, like protein, potassium, and calcium. That's why I always have an ice cold glass as soon as I get home. Hey, you know what else Mark McGuire had as soon as he got home? Steroids. So if I would have known the truth, I wouldn't have wasted my time with milk. I would have been on that juice instead. Man, the power of our glorious God. Man, Mark McGuire was a was a powerful hitter. Uh, and when someone is worthy of the glory, it's only right to let them have the glory. This plays out all around us uh, when we compete according to the rules and someone wins, we celebrate, or at the very least, we acknowledge they are worthy of that glory. But when someone cheats by using performance-enhancing drugs, uh, we don't celebrate for they're not worthy of the glory given their name. Today, we're continuing in our series about the life of a man called Moses. Uh, he, this sermon series is called A Man After God's Glory, for that's what Moses truly was. And what I want to point out today, and what I think you'll find in the unfolding of this sermon and study of Scripture, is that Moses was a man after God's glory because God was a God after God's glory. And it's right for God to be after his glory, by the way. This is not vain. This is not pretentious. For just like in the competitions mentioned above, if someone is worthy of the glory, it's only right that we let them have that glory. And my friends, if there is anyone worthy of glory, it is God. This is why David wrote in Psalm 29, ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And today, we are going to see his worthiness, his power, his goodness, his glory on full display. And my hope is that just like Moses lived as a man of faith after God's glory, we too would live as people of faith after God's glory. If you have your Bible, you can turn it to Exodus chapter 5. We're going to be in chapter 5 through 10 today, six chapters. Mark skipped town and gave me six chapters to tackle, to tackle today. The historical situation for our study today is tense. God's people, the Israelites, have been enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years. Now, this next bit of information may surprise you, but God actually foretold this reality to Abram, the father of the Jewish nation, all the way back in Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15 is a significant chapter in the Bible where God establishes a covenant with Abram. And in this covenant, he details the promises, conditions, and securities that will define God's relationship with his people. And in that chapter, we read these two verses, verses 13 and 14. 
Then the Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves and afterward they will come out with great possessions. Now the 400 years have come up and it's time for God's people to go free just as he had promised Abram centuries before. My friends, remember, God always keeps his promises. If you're someone who writes things down, you can write that down. God always keeps his promises. He may be slow in doing so. We may have to be patient with him, but know this for certain, God always keeps his promises. Last week, we encountered Moses. We met his brother Aaron as well. These were men after God's glory, and he has chosen these two brothers to be his personification to Pharaoh as God moves forward in setting his people free. We're going to begin now in Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. It says this, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. This three-day hiatus to go into the the, the wilderness and to worship was not even the big ask that would turn into the exodus. We'll notice that this was just a temporary reprieve from the harsh harassment at the hands of the Egyptian slave drivers, but Pharaoh refused this request. It's wrong of him to do so. But Pharaoh's ultimate trespass is when he says, I do not know the Lord. These words would ultimately lead to his ruin. And throughout this narrative, you will notice phrases like, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, or Pharaoh's heart was hardened, or Pharaoh's heart became hard. I believe that this statement when Pharaoh says, I do not know the Lord, is an act of aggression against God and is the beginning of his heart being hardened. So which is it? Did God harden his heart? Was Pharaoh's heart hardened? Did it just become hard because of the situation? I don't know if I have a clear answer for you today. All I know is this. If you set yourself against God, he will set himself against you and you will come to ruin. For God always has victory over his enemies and his power is always enough to accomplish his promises. And he promised centuries before that his people would go free and they're about to do so. Pharaoh is undoubtedly the actor of evil in this story, and he positions himself against the glory of God and the good of God's people. He doubles down, in fact, on the brutality, increasing the demand of work while decreasing the the resources with which to work. This is an injustice that God won't stand for, but it's also an injustice that frustrates the Israelites uh, in charge of overseeing the task. And ironically, they're frustrated mostly with Moses. This next passage of scripture I'm going to read is fairly lengthy, but I think it'll be helpful for us in understanding the context of the situation and God's character. This is Exodus chapter 5, verses 19 through 6, 8. It says, The Israelite overseers realized that they were in trouble when they were told, You are not to reduce the number of bricks required for you each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them, and they said, May the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord, have you brought trouble on this people? Is that why you have sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people and you have not rescued your people at all. Then the Lord said, Now, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people. And I will hear, I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Remember, 
Our God always keeps his promises. And we see here that he will keep his promises, number one, for the glory of his name, and number two, for the good of his people. Those two things are connected. For the glory of God always results in good for those who are with him. And Pharaoh is soon to learn that the glory of God results in ruin for those who are against him. Now, now I want to pause here. I think we should reflect on something important. This showdown is squarely between God and Pharaoh. But it's Moses and his brother Aaron who find themselves in the middle of it all as God's representatives. Have you heard the term that psychologists use? It's flight, fight, freeze. Have you heard this term? Yes. I'm curious by those of you who are in the room, which one you identify with. When you're startled or something scares you or you come into a tense situation, uh, who in the room by a show of hands would typically fly? Like I'm a flighter. I'm going to get out of that situation. Let me see your hands. You're not raising your hands. You're looking for the door, aren't you? You're trying to get out of this place. Yeah, I know. I know. Who in the room is a fighter? Who's going to fight in those situations? Yeah, keep your hands to yourself, please, uh, during this sermon. We we'll really appreciate that. Who's a freezer who just freezes, yeah, tenses up? Okay, I found out what I was uh, recently. Uh, about a month ago, we were taking a trip to uh, Poland, some of the people from this church, and we were going to visit our impact partners, Mac and Olivia Johnson, uh, over in Poland. And it was the last night of the trip, and one of the, the, the lady small group leaders took her high, her high school girls, and they uh, did these, like, uh, face masks, the things that you put on your face, like, make your skin. I don't know exactly what they are. I just know Mark does them all the time in the office, and I'm not entirely sure what the purpose is, but... Um, they were doing them, and uh, they, uh, they, they sent out a group message. Says, Anybody wants to come by the room? And I didn't, but I mean, I sent a number, a room number, you know. I just sent the room number. There was a couple of doors down from me because I wanted to see these high school girls knock on a random Polish family's hotel room and see what would happen, you know. Nobody was home. Pretty bummed. I thought the night was over, but I sent a second room number, and they went again. I was so excited. In college, I majored in ministry, minored in mischief. It was so fun. I love pulling practical jokes. And this time I sent them to somebody who was actually on the trip and it was a fun moment. Well, the girls found out that I could not be trusted and they set out to plot their revenge. Didn't you, Lydia? I see you right there. I'm so proud. Lydia and Meredith here in the front row, our second row. She called the, the front desk of the hotel, pretending to be my mom, saying that I needed medicine because I was sick and asked what my room number was. And they gave it to you, didn't they? They gave it to you. Well, I got out of my room to take some real medicine to somebody who was really sick. And while I was doing that, some of the high school girls went up to my floor, got beside where the elevator was. As soon as I hopped off the elevator, turned the corner, there they were. They jumped out and they startled me. And I'll admit it, I was a little scared. And I found out in the moment that I'm a freezer. Thank God I'm not a fighter. I didn't punch one of the high school girls there. <laughs> Can you imagine the Polish headlines? American pastor punches girl in Krakow Hotel. I mean, horrible, <laughs> horrible. Fly, fight, freeze. These are the situations that psychologists say we most often find ourselves when we're startled. But there's a fourth option, faith. Once things kind of calm down and you can count the cost, it's most appropriate and only appropriate for those who claim Christ to act in faith. We shouldn't flee our problems. We, should, we, we shouldn't fight our problems with our own devices. We shouldn't freeze in fear. We should act in faith. Faith is how Moses lived much of his life as a man after God's glory. The author of Hebrews includes Moses in chapter 11, which is known as the Hall of Faith, when he writes, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger, he preserved, persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover in the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Now, we shouldn't and we won't pretend that Moses is the hero of this story. He's not. God is. But we will honor, and I would suggest we should emulate the faith of Moses in this story. Do you know what I love about Moses? He's just like you and me. He had fears. He felt inadequacies. He said it twice in chapter six that he's not a very good speaker. Why would Pharaoh listen to me? I speak with faltering lips. Hey, it's probably true that Moses had the same fear that scares more people than anything else. Moses was probably afraid of public speaking. 
This was his reality that he was facing, but he takes, takes the task anyway. Despite his fears, despite his inadequacies he, inadequacies, he acts in faith and he prepares to get in the ring against the most powerful person in the known world. This moment in Moses' life reminds me of the great speech from our 26th president, Theodore Roosevelt. It's an excerpt from a speech called The Man in the Arena. It says this, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither knew victory nor defeat. Moses stepped into the ring. He stepped into the arena in faith to win glory for God. Right now, uh, this spring, I'm coaching a three and four year old soccer team. I'm one of the assistant coaches. Have you ever attended one of these games? It's a circus. I absolutely love it. I wish we played double headers every night. This is the best comedy you can ever find. The four year olds on our team are our best players. I'm sure this is true uh, of most of the teams in, in the league. My son, Willie, he's three. He's one of the smaller ones on the team. At the beginning of the season, he was boasting about just how many goals he was going to score this soccer season. First few games, I don't think he touched the soccer ball once. You know the little mass of kids that just runs around the field like this, usually kicking it toward the wrong goal? He wasn't even getting in there. So we're sitting at the dinner table, and he's talking about how many, he's going to score 200 goals next game. I said, son, you don't even play two minutes of the game. you got to get in there. And he said, you know what he said to me? He said, dad, I'll fight for the ball when I'm four years old. And I said, son, wrong answer. That is not the answer we're looking for. And by some encouragement and the bribery of ice cream, he's finally getting in there. He's scored two goals so far on the season. But what, don't we do the same thing? I mean, it crushed my heart when he said, I'll fight for the ball when I'm four years old. Like, I'm going to wait until I'm ready. But we do the same thing, don't we? Uh, when, when I'm more compelling, I'll share the gospel with my neighbor. When I know more, I'll talk to that person about their doubts. When we have more money, we'll get out of debt. When I'm not so busy at work, I'll be a more present dad. When someone asks, well, then I'll start serving the church. When this happens, then I'll do this. My friends, I don't know everybody's situation in here, so I'm not going to make a judgment call on where you are in life. I just know that the reality is this. God has not called us to be on the sidelines. He's called us to act in faith and get in the game. Whether we want to flee from it, fight it with our own devices, or freeze because of fear, he has called us to act in faith and to get in the game. For it is innate within us we were created to win glory in the arenas in which we find ourselves. But when we get into the arena to fight for his glory, we don't do so for our name. We do so for his name because we claim, can't claim the name of Christ. We endeavor to evangelize, not so that people will know us, but so that people will know our God. We give generously, not so that people will be impressed with us, but so that people will be impressed by our God. We live rightly, not so that people will be impressed by us, but so that people will be impressed by our God. In his wisdom, God allows us to participate in the furtherment of his glory and his people's good. This is how God has chosen to operate throughout history against his enemies. God against the Philistines. David in the middle. God against Babylon. Daniel in the middle. God against Persia. Esther in the middle. God against Pharaoh. There's Moses, right there in the middle of it all. He has stepped into the arena to win glory for God. And the first round unfolds in this way. Exodus chapter seven, verse eight. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh and it will become a snake. And it did. Aaron threw down his staff and it became a snake. But Pharaoh's magicians, they also threw down their staffs and they too became snakes. But Exodus chapter 7, verse 12 says this, Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs, yet Pharaoh's heart became hard and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. And my friends, with that, the fight for glory is on. The fight for God's people's freedom is on. 
and ruin would come to his enemies. What happens next is a chain of unfolding and at the same time liberating and devastating supernatural disasters known as the 10 plagues. Exodus chapter 7 verse 14 through chapter 10 verse 20 tells the consequential story of the first eight plagues that God struck Egypt with. This week, we're going to talk about those first eight plagues. Next week, we're going to talk about the last two and what they point forward to. So will you come back next week? Can I count on that? All right. Royals fans going to be, you know, just watching the game or something. Anyways, here are the first eight plagues. The plague of blood, the plague of frogs, the plague of gnats, the plague of flies, the plague of livestock, of boils, of hail, of locusts. Those all sound pleasant, don't they? These are really nice sayings. The purpose of the plagues was threefold. If you write things down, write this down. First, they were to bring glory to God. Second, they were to bring freedom for God's people. And third, they were to bring ruin to God's enemy. Glory to God, freedom for his people, ruin to his enemy. The first purpose of the plagues, glory to God. The Lord spoke to Moses in order to begin the plagues, and the Lord tells Moses to relay this to Pharaoh in Exodus 7, 16 and 17. It says this, Then say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go, hear this, so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now you have not listened. This is what the Lord says, by this you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff in his hand, I will strike the water of the Nile and it will be changed into blood. The phrase, so that they may worship me, is mentioned eight times as the reason given for why God wants his people to be set free. The plagues that God would bring would be nothing short of miraculous, my friends, supernatural disasters that demonstrated his glorious power. But what's interesting to me is that Pharaoh's magicians were able to replicate the first two plagues. This is true. After God turned the Nile into blood, we read this in chapter 7, verse 22, but the Egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts. And after the plague of frogs, the second plague, we read this, Exodus 8, 6. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land. But the magicians did the same thing by their secret arts. They also made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. But by the time we get to the third plague, the plague of gnats, we read this. But when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. And then we get to the sixth plague, the plague of boils, we learn The magicians could not stand before Moses because the boils that were on them are on all the Egyptians. Hey, is God a pool shark? Do you know what a pool shark is? Someone who pretends not to be very good at pool and then they bet money on the game and they beat the people that they just bet and then they take all the money away. Why is God allowing these magicians to play along with him for the first two plagues? Is he a pool shark? I'm not sure, but I do know this. I'm reminded of what Paul wrote to the church in Rome. If God is for us, who can be against us? The silly magicians with their secret arts were never a match for the maker of heaven and earth. Before the plague of hail, God admits that he had been purposely holding back. I'm telling you, he is a pool shark. Exodus chapter 9, verses 13 through 16 say this. Then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning. Confront Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so that they may worship me. Or this time, I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people so that you may know there is no one like me in all the earth. For by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. But I have raised you up for this very purpose that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. The power of our glorious God is on full display. Earlier in the sermon, I said something about Moses and God that I want to make sure we still have on our minds. Moses was a man after God's glory. Why? Because God was a God after God's glory. God wanted his glory to be known, not just that day, but for generations to come. These are the instructions that before the eighth plague, the plague of locusts that he gives, he says, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials so that I may perform these signs of mine among them, that you may tell your children and your grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. 
God's glory is to be known. From the first plague to the tenth plague, the purpose of the plagues for God's glory remains that Pharaoh and the Egyptians would know the glory of the Lord, that the Israelites would know the glory of the Lord, and that their children and their children's children would know the glory of the Lord. Moses was a man after God's glory because God was a God after God's glory, and it is right for him to do so because he is worthy of it. The next part, a little teaser here for for your further study. Uh, The Egyptians were polytheists, meaning they worshiped a multitude of false gods. And many scholars suggest, and I do think that there is sufficient evidence to believe this theory, that each of the plagues was a direct attack on an Egyptian deity. For example, the Egyptian god Hapi, H-A-P-I, I will describe in simple terms because we have children in the room, was a fat old man with a woman's torso. It's a weird, gross image, but, but evil is always gross. He was a personification of the Nile's bountiful fertility. And the Nile truly was the life source of Egypt. When the, learn, when the Lord turned the Nile into blood, he cut off the main water supply and it killed a lot of the fish. Their fishery was devastated. It was a direct attack on Happy's ability to provide. And there seems to be a correlation between most of the plagues and the Egyptian deity's failure to match God's glory. Their gods, their magicians, Pharaoh, paled in comparison to the glory of the maker of heaven and earth. The first purpose of the plagues, to bring God glory. The second purpose of the plague, to bring freedom for God's glory people. God told the brothers to say this in Exodus 7, 16. The Lord, the God of the Hebrews has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now you have not listened. And like the phrase, so that they may worship me, the phrase, let my people go is a refrain throughout the whole narrative, most often used together so that they may worship me. Something really interesting happens in chapter 9 with the plague on the livestock. Um, up until now, the first uh, four plagues, they, they, they had affected both Egypt and Israel. But in Exodus chapter 9, verse 1, we see something interesting. It says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says, Let my people go so that they may worship me. Now the plague on the livestock is the first plague in which there is a divine discrimination as to who is plagued. We get more detail into this plague's conditions in verses two through four. If you refuse to let them go and contribute to hold and and continue to hold them back, the hand of the Lord will bring a terrible plague on your livestock and the field, on your horses, donkeys, and camels, and on your cattle, sheep, and goats. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and that of Egypt, so that no animal belonging to the Israelites will die. (laughs) The first two plagues, God let Pharaoh's magicians play along and participate in what was going on. But after a while, they couldn't keep up. The third and fourth plague still affected the Israelites as well as the Egyptians. But the last six plagues precisely pained the Egyptians alone. So we call back now to Genesis chapter 15, that covenantal chapter where God and Abraham made a covenant. We read this, know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves and afterward they will come out with great possessions. My friends, God always keeps his promises. And we see now with this divine discrimination that God is moving ever so clearly for his glory, yes, but also, also for his people's freedom. And lastly, what happens next is that God is moving, using these plagues for the ruin of his enemy. For over 400 years, Egypt prospered off the backs of their Israelite slaves. But now, Israel would plunder those who prospered from their pain, but not before God would bring that nation to its knees. In these plagues, Egypt faced severe socioeconomic consequences on a scale not seen to this very day or before. The plagues produced an infertile Nile, heaps of dead fish, frogs that stunk. The dust became gnats, choking the air thick. The flies were festering and the livestock was liquidated to death. The boils were so bad people could not stand. The crops were decimated by the hail. And this is what we read about the plague of locusts. They came right after the plague of hail. Exodus chapter 10 
verses 13 through 15. So Moses stretched out his staff over Egypt, and the Lord made an east wind blow across the land all that day and all that night. By morning, the wind had brought the locusts. They invaded all Egypt and settled down in every area of the country in great numbers. Never before had there been such a plague of locusts, nor will there ever be again. That's flood language. They covered all the ground until it was black. They devoured all that was left after the hail, everything growing in the fields and the fruit on its trees. Nothing green remained on tree or plant in all the land of Egypt. Life was stripped from the land. God brought ruin on his enemy, total ruin. I don't think we'll ever be able to truly appreciate this scene in history unfolding. There's no way to understand it unless you were actually there. And by no means do I want to be there. Never do I want to set myself against God in such a way that he would set himself against me that I would come to this kind of ruin. I don't want to pick a fight with God. I think everybody in this room has regrets. There's some serious regrets, some some silly regrets. At the top of my list of silly regrets is when I was in high school playing travel baseball. I was up in Kansas City with a group of guys from Oklahoma. We were playing this team from Texas. And uh, one of my teammates, he goes in to slide and and he takes the catcher out. The catcher gets up, pushes him. My teammate throws a punch and the bench is clear. I mean, the fight is on. Getting into the arena, the time is now. This is a dream for so many young boys playing baseball. This was my moment. And with my teammates, I ran out of the dugout. And then I stopped. I regret it. I mean, now it was like, have to be church league softball. I'd probably get fired if I did this, but that was my moment. And I regret not getting in the fight, but I have a good reason for doing so. I was the smallest one on the field. I knew that all those big six foot five, 250 pound guys would whip me in a second. So I just cheered, (laughs) you know, go get (laughs) them. I know it's silly, but I do regret it. Contrarily, Pharaoh picked a fight that he could not win, and he began to regret it deeply. After the hail, we read this in Exodus 10, 16. Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now forgive my sin once more and pray to the Lord your God to take this deadly plague away from me. It's clear. Pharaoh regretted his sin. But friends, there is a big difference, a big difference between regretting your sin and repenting of your sin. Repentance leads to restoration. But regretting your sin and then continuing to live in your sin will only lead to your ruin. This is exactly what happened to Pharaoh. In fact, it happened multiple times over in this narrative. God would remove one of the plagues. Pharaoh's heart would be hard against God still. I have to say it once more. Glory belongs to God. If you set yourself against God, then he will set himself against you and you will come to ruin. For God always wins the victory over his enemies. His power is always enough to accomplish his purposes. I am leaving you on a bit of a cliffhanger today. We've gone through the first eight plagues, but there's still two more to come. At this point in the story, Pharaoh still won't relent glory. God's people are still held captive. Egypt still hasn't experienced the full measure of God's wrath, but this and more is coming. I'm really excited for next week. For the story that we're preaching now is the foreshadow of a greater story that is to come. A greater exodus, an eternal freedom for God's people, an eternal destruction for God's enemy, eternal glory for the one who deserve it. But as for today... Let's continue to be faithful to what he has called us to. And as the author of Hebrews writes, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. My friends, in this moment, let us ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. I'll see you next week. Let's stand and worship the Lord.
that's broken to the core. The breath that brought the dust to life and sang the stars to form. The darkness feels evil that drove it back.
all the glory be given to you because you are worthy. Amen. Would you have a seat? This morning we've been able to sing praises to God and be challenged uh, through the message this morning. Uh, keeping uh, that theme of, of the power of our glorious God going, we're going to come around the table now and take of the elements of the Lord's Supper together as we come around Jesus' table. And throughout the last uh, two weeks, we have definitely been able to experience um, the power of God. We've been able to witness it. On Monday, we got to witness it by seeing the eclipse. And, you know, people traveled all over to be able to see that, but that is God's glory. It's the power of God. I keep thinking of, while even looking at it the other day, thinking of what it says in, in Genesis chapter 1. It reminds us in, in verse 1 that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then in verse 3, it says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And the moment I kept thinking of was the speed of light. God said there was light, and there was light. And the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. I'm also reminded of what we got to experience a few weeks ago of celebrating Easter together as we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior and the power that death has no hold over him. As I think of John chapter 3, verse 16, it reminds us that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The, the power that we've been able to see and experience are to remind us that God has us and God can keep us. And just grateful for those moments. So this morning, we're going to take the elements together. So you're going to have two cups passed to you. They will be stacked together. I appreciate you, that you separate those. The first one uh, is the bread, reminding us of the body of Christ giving his body up for us. And the juice to remind us of the blood that was shed for us. So at this time, let's pray together as we come around the table. Dear Jesus, we just thank you for these moments. Thank you for the power of your word that we've been able to sing today, but also just the power uh, of the message that was brought in the reminder um, that you are powerful, and thank you for your glory. Just thank you right now for this moment to stop and just to be able to reflect and to be able to look at where we are in our walk with you and give all things over to you. Thank you for moments like this, and it's in your name I pray. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's word. Whether you're checking us out for the first time or coming back for our online weekly gathering, our hope is that you have an experience with Jesus that makes you long for more. The truth is our lives were made for him. And we believe that we can experience the fullness of the life he offers by participating in the life of the church, which isn't a building to occupy or a screen to observe, but the community of people who call Jesus King. So we'd love to invite you to come to our in-person gatherings, which we have Thursdays at 645 and Sundays at 8, 915, and 1045. We know that not everyone's circumstances allow them to gather in person, but we believe that experiencing Jesus can't be complete if it's only contained to an hour of an online service. And we want more than that for you. We want you to join a community of Jesus followers and consume the word of God, the bread and the cup of the Lord's table, the encouragement found as we worship him, but to also give that you would be a blessing by singing, listening, sacrificing, and being an encouragement to others who need your life and testimony to remind them of the greatness of our God. If you have any more questions about Christ Church, we're here for you. We'd love to connect and together experience completeness in Jesus.
as we continue uh, our, our worship together uh, as a church family, uh, this is a moment where we stop and we pause and we give back to God. We talk about uh, moments of being generous with what God's given us. And uh, we just want to take a moment right now just to say uh, thank you to so many of you in this room. So in, November, in February, Tyler Bade, our student minister, uh, pastor, he, he came out and he just reminded us that camp was coming. And we have kids going to church camp this summer in elementary. We also have students in junior high going to mix and in high school going to move and all these opportunities for them to be able to go on trips over the summer. And those are important, especially in the life of student ministry and in children's ministry to be able to, uh, to have a little bit more time with the students to be able just to speak into their lives. And, and our prayer is this, that it's just moments that they just grow in their faith. But those uh, trips do uh, cost. And uh, so Tyler had just uh, made the appeal that if you could give up above and beyond your giving uh, toward, toward the scholarship of, of that, we would appreciate that. Well, I just want to just, first of all, just say thank you. And I am blown away as it talks about in the scripture that God can do uh, more than we ever imagined. Uh, and I uh, just want to say that since February, over $16,000 has been given to the scholarship fund. So just thank you so much for that. That is amazing. And we don't take that for granted. We appreciate you, uh, your trust with that. But also, if you've not been able have to have the opportunity to be able to give to that, uh, you can still do that. So on the screen, they're going to show, uh, again, uh, just of that QR code. You feel free to take a picture of that and to pull that up. Also, you can, uh, if you, write a, if you want to uh, write a check, that you can take it and just put it over in the memo about the student scholarship fund for camps. Anything like that, all of it goes toward that. So we just... Uh, just thank you again for that. So as we take this time now to give back, love just to pray for our, for our offering and for God to use it uh, more than we could ever imagine that he could. So let's pray together. God, we thank you for the reminder that you own it all. We thank you for moments like this just to see that all of us coming together can do major things for the kingdom that uh, sometimes feels uh, bigger than we could uh, imagine. Just thank you for moments like this. Thank you for uh, just this reminder that uh, whatever that we have, uh, it is because of you. Uh, just help us to be bold and to be courageous in our faith. And just to thank you again for this reminder uh, that what is ours is yours. Thank you so much for moments like this. In your name I pray, amen. So the last thing I want to be able to do now as the offering is bags are being passed is to kind of give to give you two reminders and, and a new announcement so the two reminders of this first of all this coming uh friday morning at 6 a.m is our last uh, men's prayer breakfast of the semester so that is at 6 a.m it is at the uh, mining days event center back behind the praying hand so it starts at 6 and ends by 7 30 in the morning so man this is a great opportunity to be able to come to be challenged to be inspired to have community uh and to get to eat some really bad food early in the morning. So that's always healthy and great for you. So, but if you could, we would just love for you to be a part of that. If you want to register for that, you can by going to cco.church slash register, uh, but just love for you to be a part of that. Also, uh, on the 26th uh, of April, it, and at six o'clock that evening, uh, our ladies' night is usually on Monday nights, and we're moving this one for a special night. It's called Ladies' Night on Friday. It's April 26th, and it will be a time to come together uh, for the ladies, for you to be able to have a meal together. Uh, you'll do worship, uh, and you'll have a, a message brought to you, and that entire night is just to remind you that you, we are all woven together by, by God's mighty hand. So just want to encourage you to do that. I'd love for you to register for that. The cost of that is $10. That covers the meal for that night, but it would just be a great evening together, and it starts at six o'clock and it will be um again it is ten dollars and we'd love for you to register for that at cco.church slash register the last thing is the color code seminar that is coming up this coming weekend on on april the 19th and 20th it's a friday evening and a saturday and what color code does is, is you take an assessment and you find out the motive of what drives you what what makes you who you are so my motive it, that it talks about is is that my colors are white, yellow, red, and blue. And, uh, but the first two primary colors reminds me that I like to have fun, but I really like peace. And, uh, but, my pure, but my pure core motive is peace. So even in our churches, we talk about we want all of us to experience completeness with Jesus. 
One of the things is we got to know, know how God wired us, and this is a great opportunity to be able to do this. The cost of it is $30, and it's per person, and that includes uh, lunch on that Saturday. But we'd love for you to sign up for that at cco.church slash register, but also would love for you to sign up by Wednesday if you could because that way we can get the assessment to you, and that way we have all the materials for you when you get here. But it's a great evening. Uh, it goes by fast. You find out just how awesome you are, and also you find out you know what your strengths are and some of your limitations. Uh, the limitation part took a little while for me, so I had to look at that one for a little while, but it was a great evening and a great morning just for me to learn more about myself and just to learn how God created me. So just encourage you to be a part of that. Last thing this morning is we get to experience some baptisms together, and what a great time it uh, is just that we get to celebrate that together. So I'd love for you to look over and to watch the baptisms. Good morning, guys. I'm here with the Arft family, and Austin and Abby have decided to make the best, uh, most important decision of the rest of their life. So Austin, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes, sir. And do you believe that he died and resurrected for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes, sir. And do you agree to make him your Lord and Savior for the rest of your life? Yes, sir. All right, Austin, because of your confession, I'm now going to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and for the promise of the Holy Spirit. This is Abby, and Abby is one of our kiddos in Kids Club, and we are so excited that she is also making the decision to follow Jesus forever, and I'm excited just for the Arft family being able to do this together and follow Jesus for the rest of your lives all together um, as a family. So Abby, I'm going to ask you just a few questions now. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes, ma'am. And do you um, believe that Jesus came to earth and died um, for your sins and resurrected so that you could be forgiven? Yes, ma'am. And do you want to spend the rest of your life following Jesus? Yes, ma'am. Okay. It's because of your confession of faith. I'll baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
together. You guys are dismissed. As you leave, remember, there's if you need prayer, you need to talk to somebody, there's people at the tables. We'll see you next week.